Hello? Do you hear me? Yes, now we can hear. Hmm, very strange. So, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everybody to this last but not the least session in the 2022 Glaucoma series uh, lectures. And uh, we are very proud uh, this session to have Professor Yahya Salah uh, with us. And um, uh, now we, we are streaming uh, through the YouTube. And uh, just, uh, just a second to be sure that everything is going perfectly uh, before we start. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, Professor Yahya Salah is a well-known international figure in cataract surgery. He is a pioneer in complicated cataract surgery uh, management. So, uh, this is why uh, we are lucky today to have him to uh, show us challenging cases in glaucoma, cataract and glaucoma. He is a professor of ophthalmology in Qasr al-Aini Faculty of Medicine in Cairo since 2005. And uh, he is an international speaker in many conferences and a researcher. He has uh, many publications and he has his own uh, videos um, uh, explaining uh, difficult cases in, in cataract uh, uh, procedures. And I would like to welcome as well uh, Dr. Basil Qadura, who is a glaucoma consultant working in Sweden. He will be with us to help me moderate this session. So thank you for both of you, uh, Professor Yahya and Dr. Basil for um, this nice session. And of course, welcome to everybody who, who are joining us and more and more during this session. So uh, the stage is yours, Professor Yahya. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mazen, uh, for giving me the opportunity to share in the great work Sinjaba Academy is doing over the past few years. Uh, thank you, Dr. Basil, for joining us. And I will try to, to go through some of the points that I think are important in cataract surgery in glaucomatous patients. <clears throat> so we start with, the, we all know that cataract and glaucoma are the leading causes of blindness worldwide with the, the glaucoma uh, causing 8% of this. And the cataract and glaucoma frequently coexist. So it's a, a common problem that we face and we should know how to answer the questions as cataract surgeons that will face us and we need to answer it. The first question is what's the effect of fecal ossification and intraocular pressure in different types of glaucoma? What are the risks of fecal ossification in glaucomatous eyes? What are the difficulties and risks of fecal modifications in patients with previous successful glaucoma surgery? And when do FACO do to do FACO only or combined procedure or sequential surgery in a glaucoma, glaucomatous patients? Cataract surgery challenges will reside in preoperatively to take a decision. What should I do? What should what procedure should I take? Should I do only FACO or glaucoma or glaucoma and then FACO? And operatively, you have to customize your technique to, to avoid the, the very well-known expected complications and delicacy of the patients, the, particularly the corneal endothelium in glaucomatous patients, because the aim is to provide a technique that ensures safety for the patient, both, both for the cornea and as a refractive results, but as well to the usually compromised optic nerve. So we have to be aware of this. And post-operatively, we can have IOP spikes that can affect a, a compromised optic disc, or we can have even glaucoma starting in special cases after uh, the cataract surgery. And we have to pay attention that we can have some refractive surprises, particularly astigmatism due to sutures, if we do a tropicalectomy that we need to suture it. So we have to be aware 
of the challenges that uh, would meet us in such cases, and we should go through many of them. And there is specific challenge in particular in patients with short eyes, very high myopia, shallow anterior chamber, thick sclera, risk is supposed to operative choroidal detachment, difficulty in biometry, difficulty choosing the eye well. So there are specific, less common problem with the short eyes, but let us move through other important uh, problems. So we should go through uh, some of the things that, what's the impact of fake homosification in the intraoperative pressure? It's debatable, some it's uh, different uh, ideas or uh, concept, but there is a lowering effect of uh, fake homosification in the intraoperative pressure, whatever kind of cataract surgery, how much, how long it persists, it varies the opinion. And uh, the factors that should affect our decision and consequently the results is the disease this disease st stage is this is uh, a patient with a, a little copying, early glaucoma. Uh, so uh, versus very late the compromised cop 0.9, for example, and the risks that the surgery will carry for him. The preoperative intraocular pressure is very important factor. Usually, we know by now that the higher the preoperative intraocular pressure, the more the effect of lowering pressure with fecal calcification. Number of medications. If a patient coming with four cataract with a multiple drug therapy, this may be a good candidate for combined surgery. So, a lot of things should be considered in that regard. Gonioscopy, of course, to verify which type of glaucoma and the scale of the surgeon is a really important uh, factor that can affect much the safety of the surgeon. These are the types we all know about the glaucoma. There are open angle, whatever, primary or secondary, angle closure, pseudo exfoliation should be as a, put as an anti and others as we're going to see later on. In open angle glaucoma, the higher the pre-operative pressure, the higher the effect of fake homosification, and this is more so in pigmentary glaucoma because of the trabecular washout of uh, the trabecular pigment aspiration and washout during the surgery. Long-term results seen in different studies showing decrease in IOP with decrease in number of medication, which is an, a good thing to achieve. In angle closure glaucoma, whether suspect or, or chronic angle closure or acute angle closure and plateau iris, and all of this, there is a lowering effect of, of fake homosification in the intraocular pressure as it widens the angle and reduces IOP diurnal vari variation. And, uh, and the, the Eagle study, which have shifted a lot of people of doing uh, as a primary procedure for angle closure glaucoma, primary angle closure glaucoma and, and the acute angle closure glaucoma to do lens surgery rather than uh, peripheral idectomy. It was done in, and recommendations in, in the patients with the pressure more than 30 millimeters of mercury, but in general, the attitude now shifting toward lens uh, extraction in such cases. And in cro angle closure, in chronic angle closure uh, glaucoma, we can add plus the fake homosification, other maneuvers as viscosinicolysis or even a trabeculotomy or a GET, as we're going to see. There are risks and difficult specific fake homosification in glucometer's eyes. The coronary endothelium, remember the, that most of the patients with glaucoma, long or chronic uh, glaucoma, they have their older age. They have been using drugs for a very long time. And uh, for, for some reason, this patient, their coronary endothelium is very sensitive, very vulnerable to be affected. So the technique has to be, you have, this is your main challenge in doing the fake homosification in such cases, because you, you will do all your best to protect the endothelium uh, uh, as we're going to talk later on. In an angle closure, trachoma anterior chamber is shallow, and this adds difficulty in doing the rexes, manipulating inside the eye, and you might be faced with peripheral anterior synechia of different degrees, whether peripheral or even getting more central. You can have post-operative rise in, 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 in the pressure. In some cases, like special cases like the long anterior denules, I'm going to show later on, and you, you might jeopardize a functioning bleb 
if you have a function that we know it is affected, usually it can fail in a good percentage of patients after uh, uh, phaco massification. So should, we should take the utmost care and time spacing between the surgery of glaucoma and cataract if we are doing uh, uh, the surgery and you might risk a compromised disc and this entails a new technique to lower the pressure, to shorten the surgery, to avoid a lot of fluctuations of pressure uh, because this is very important to ensure that the, the, you don't compromise the disc. With a functioning bleb, it is known that a phaco massification in the presence of a functioning bleb increases the risk of bleb failure in 33% of patients and uh, this should be considered and talked with the patient. And also the time when you do it, uh, usually you can postpone the surgery after the, sur the primary uh, glaucoma surgery, like three to six months. When to use combined procedures, if we have simultaneously visually significant cataract and medically uncontrolled glaucoma, like a patient with a multiple surgery, multiple drugs, and it's not controlled, or even if controlled, it's a good uh, opportunity to do both uh, surgeries, and the patients with advanced glaucomatous optic nerve da damage or severe visual field loss. What we can do in these combined surgeries, we can do fake emulsification plus trabeculectomy with mitomycin, this is the yeah, any gold standard technique. We can use non-penetrating procedures. We can use, and it's coming more in vogue now, trabeculotomy and minimally invasive glaucoma surgery in our university. What is most commonly used is the GAT, as I'm going to show later on. And you can even use glaucoma drainage device. And of course, you can choose the technique that you are more comfortable with, and you can customize the technique for the condition of the patient. Take with trabeculotomy, we usually use mitomycin C in the concentration between 0.2 to 0.4%. And the, the results are good, but there are risks that you can have hypotony, postoperative shallow anterior chamber. You can induce refractive change, uh, changes to, uh, through the sutures you take. So it's a very efficient and useful technique that is the gold standard, but yet you have to consider the possible intraoperative and postoperative complications. Microinvasive glaucoma surgery and cataract, what we are used to do in our department is the angle canal-based gonioscopy assisted transhuman and trabeculotomy get because it's a very cheap uh, procedure, fast procedure, inexpensive and usually efficient and Actually, you can do it in open angle glaucoma and angle closure glaucoma, although in angle closure glaucoma, it's a little bit debatable, but we're currently uh, working or almost finished the study and the results of angle closure, trabecular, uh, fake emulsification alone versus uh, GAT in angle closure glaucoma. Other types that can reach to of, uh, of angle uh, ca canal base, supraciliary shunting, translimbal shunting, cyclodestruction. Uh, the the MEGs are usually they in, in some instance less effective than trabeculectomy, but definitely much, much safer. And if you're doing cataract together with it, you have uh, no effect on the, uh, the refractive result. Of course, there's some complication like high FEMA, but usually it resolves uh, over one or two weeks. So factors of success depends on the type of glaucoma, the severity, severity of the damage of the optic nerve, amount of time and time of use of topical medications, if the patient have done previous surgeries, and accordingly we choose the type of surgery to be performed. Let's go into different scenarios discussing these different techniques and different situations. I'm going to start with the uh, classic combined trabeculectomy with uh, phaco emulsification. Usually I will choose to do the trabeculectomy at, nine, at, at 12 o'clock. I usually do my phaco in the temporal, uh, through a temporal incision. So you separate the sites and this have been shown that different sites of the incisions improve the, uh, the results of the trabeculectomy in combined procedure. And I use mitomycin 0.2, 0.4%. I injected 
subconjunctively, like uh, uh, near the fornix, 1.5 to 1 milliliters before I open the conjunctiva. And this trick I've learned from Professor Ahmed Abdurrahman, and he, really it works very fine, very fine. And once you open the conjunctiva, you wash it away, you wash every, if any uh, mitomycet, you wash it. I don't use the sponge anymore. He is opening the conjunctiva. This is a fornix based flap. And then with a crescent knife, this is a good trick that you, you, uh, you do your clear flap without too much dissection. You get into the plane you want. Usually in such cases, of course, the thickness of the flap affects the filtration, but if you do a combined surgery, it's better to do a thicker flap rather than a thinner flap. Then you move with the microscope to, to the temporal side, do your classic phaco, but I want you to look at the gauges. While doing the phaco, you see the power. The power is very little. It uses, I'm using it into buzzes, working in the posterior chamber. It, the most important thing is to protect the corneal endothelium. Working away from the endothelium is the most important thing. Using lesser power is the second most important. And the time it takes you to finish the surgery is the third important. So it's not about the time of the surgery, how long it takes, but it's where you are doing your phaco massification in relation to the cornea. So a posterior uh, capsule uh, uh, working in the capsular bag is very efficient in protecting the endothelium. Then you go back again to 12 o'clock position, you remove the trabeculum, do a peripheral aldectomy, Though some people doesn't do iridectomy, a peripheral iridectomy in combined procedures, and then you close the flap tight because you don't want you don't want any shallowness of the anterior chamber postoperatively, and usually this will work fine. This is the classic, but you can see there are sutures that can affect the corneal cylinder and the astigmatism, and, and consequently will affect the uh, refractive results postoperatively. Then we can move to uh, another technique, which is deep sclerectomy. This is courtesy of Professor Ahmed Abdurrahman, Mustafa Abdurrahman, which is a, a technique I don't know, but, but I don't do, but it's a valid technique and he's an expert in this. So you can see he, again, he's doing his flap at 12 o'clock. We do it at 12 o'clock. This is a larger uh, flap, wider flap. Then dissecting the sclera, the first is clearer flap. And immediately after he does this, he will shift, or you should shift after exposing, reaching where you want to, to reach dissecting into the clear cornea, exposing the roof of the Schlems canal. Then he uses another side. As we said, it's always better to separate the phaco incision from the area of trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy, or whatever uh, filtering procedure you're using. Then using your normal technique, again, remember always that your main challenge in cataract in glucomatous patient is to protect the corneal endothelium. It's not nice that you think you've done a good surgery and then you, you find next morning that you have corneal decompensation. After implanting the lens, now you move on to remove the deeper flap until you expose the roof of the Schlems canal and you, you check the filtration and, the, and then you are done. The advantage of deep sclerectomy in such cases that the risk of having hypotony or a shallow anterior chamber or a lost anterior chamber postoperatively is definitely much less, but still it has the disadvantage of having sutures and affecting the result. You can see the percolation of the aqueous, making sure it percolates well. And then the flap will be closed with sutures and the conjunctiva will be closed. What's, if we have a 
if you do FACO in a glucomatous eye, shallow anterior chamber, there are challenges. The challenges resides that sometimes you have a narrow pupil, very narrow pupil, you cannot wide. Of course, you can use different techniques to widen the pupil from iris hooks, from injecting a phenyl, a, a adrenaline a, intracamerally, or using high viscosity, viscoelastic like helium-5, different or malugan ring, but one of the main difficulties are the shallow anterior chamber makes the capsulorex is difficult. The high positive pressure makes it difficult. The iris may prolapse, as you see here. This is a patient who has done previous glaucoma surgery and, and now is coming for the cataract surgery. Pupil does not dilate much. There are some synechia. You can see pupil is prolapsing, and this is a lot of noise, noises to the surgeon. Capsulorexis is not easy because the iris keeps prolapsing. And if the patient is old, you have always one of the things that you have to be very aware of is the blood pressure of the patient because these patients are liable to get suprachoroidal hemorrhage. This, and this may be a reason of high positive pressure intraoperative. You can see here, I couldn't work unless I reintroduced the iris. You have to be fixed, use the minimal ultrasound, and this was not hard, so just phaco aspiration. I will leave the, the iris prolapsing, including the opening. I will not keep trying to get it in because it will get more flare. And then I finish my irrigation aspiration. Then I will try from another side to reposit the iris and then implant the intraocular lens in the capsular bag. And in such patients, uh, you, you, if you have this iris prolapsing, you have to suture the, the incision. Don't risk having an incision that can be compromised in such patients because you can get even post-operative suprachoroidal hemorrhage, which is a great risk for in these patients. So actually this patient, I've done his other eye, so I decided after this experience that I don't want to enter the eye except when I do phaco emulsification. So I decided to use femto laser. In, in this case, I will, I will do my rexes, which is one of the difficult things in the very shallow anterior chamber. And I'll do my incisions. I constructed where I want. So this is very, uh, I, I thought it might be useful. It's an, a patient that had done peripheral idotomies, he had chronic angle closure glaucoma, pressure was controlled by two, three drugs. And I decided to do uh, fake emulsification and gonioseinicolysis. So here the rex is already done, incisions well constructed, and start mechanically to dissect the, the peripheral anterior synechia. You, the bubbles you see is, are the one from the uh, femto laser. This is the uh, very good femto laser that creates very little bubble because of the low energy. Here I'm displacing the rexes, so I have a good rexes. You can see I, the incision is better constructed here. I don't get the prolapse of the iris. So I'm more focused into the surgery itself, not to try to overcome unexpected problems. Injecting viscoelastic in the angle, trying to displace and open the angle. You see, this is a high viscosity viscoelastic, a cohesive viscoelastic. And then, as you can see, it's already segmented, but it's not the problem. The main use of the uh, femto here is to do the rexes, not the segmentation. And as you can see, again, as in any glaucoma surgery, you have to remember to work in the posterior chamber. If you ever go to the anterior chamber, use 
only vacuum. And as a rule, use the main player is the vacuum. You set high vacuum, depend on the, your machine, 400, 450, high flow rate, and very low power. The power is used only just to help you aspirate. So it goes in bubbles, it buzzes. And you can see the fine air, the very fine air bubbles are stable, not the bigger ones. So this means that the corneal endothelium is protected. This is a good trick to monitor the effect of your phaco massification and fluidics on the corneal endothelium. Always remember the corneal endothelium in glaucomatous patients. And here there are some cells and the pacification of the posterior capsule. I'll try to peel it because you want to finish everything in, the, in one surgery. So I decided to do a posterior capsular access in a technique that is very reproducible, just you inside the posterior capsule, you inject this bolus is very viscoelastic to push away the anterior vitreous face, then viscoelastic in front of the posterior capsule to equalize the pressure in front and behind the posterior capsule, and then you go on to do your posterior capsular access. It's a very reproducible technique, once you learn it properly, you can do it without fear and any time you need to do it. So then you inflate the bag with viscoelastic in different points because it's not a continuous bag anymore and be prepared to, to receive the intraocular lens in the capsular bag. You can see here the sites of peripheral iridotomies that was done previously for this patient. Then I'll start to look to pull the iris, trying to open the angle again, stretch the iris. You have to be careful because you can induce some hyphema. You see, like, so I'm stretching the iris in different points. After, at the beginning, I did mechanical uh, goniocynecolysis and then visco dissection again, opening the angle. You can see blood trickling. You have to be careful, but you don't panic. You stop, elevate the pressure with viscoelastic until this blood will clot. And then you remove it. And here you don't need to suture. As you have seen here, the visco, uh, and mechanical goniocynecolysis is actually blind. So it's better to do it under vision using a direct gonioscope. So this is again, another video, nice video in a patient with chronic angle closure glaucoma, serious anechia from previous attacks, dissected easily because it's in one sector. Fake was done in your preferred technique. There is nothing special, whether you sit temporal, superior, superior temporal. The most important thing, again, I will repeat this all over. It is the corneal endothelium in any type of glaucoma. You have to be aware how to protect it, whether using cohesive, uh, uh, dispersive viscoelastic, uh, working in the posterior chamber, using minimal ultrasound uh, power, it's very important. After doing the phaco massification, uh, injection of the intraocular lens, then you, you can put the diagonoscope 
and you'll see the synechia. Instead of what I did previously blindly, here you can do it under clear vision. But if you don't have it, you can do the, the technique I used in the previous surgery. Now I got this lens, so I, I use this lens as well. You can obviously see under vision, dissecting and opening the angle. The nice thing about this technique that you, it doesn't need a lot of, it doesn't need any expensive instruments. It's under vision. The results are very good. You don't need to do a trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy, any other complicated surgery. Just what you need to do is to open the angle. And usually these patients in the follow-up period for longer periods, they, they get very, very good results. You go 360 degrees. And again, this pulling of the iris to stretch it and open the angle is very useful and to help the pupil to get smaller. This stretching maneuver is very useful. You can use the micro forceps or even the capsular axis, regular capsular axis, you can do this. Another technique that I am learning now to, to use, uh, I've done maybe one or two cases, but uh, Dr. Yasmin said have done maybe tens and tens of cases. And it's very good in my department. We have uh, many of the glaucoma surgeons, they are doing this technique. And I think it's one of the best mixed techniques because very inexpensive, very fast, very efficient. And the more the results will show up in different publications, people I think will shift very much for this very simple, inexpensive technique that is very suitable, particularly in our area of the world to, to use. So this is Dr. Yasmin doing fecal, regular fake emulsification. And once the surgery is finished, you implant the lens and then using the same Direct gonioscope, like the one we use in goniotomy, you, 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 with visco, you just open the angle, slit, trabecular mesh work, just to get an opening into the Schlems canal. And then you, this is a 5-0 proline. You pass it into the Schlems canal all through 360 degrees. And if you have resistance while pushing this, means you are in the wrong plane. You see, it comes from the other side and ju you just pull it out, then it will tear the wall of Schlem's canal and uh, it's as if you did a trabeculotomy ab internum. The only thing with, with, with the fake emulsification, we do it with fake emulsification that very, yani, not in a, a, a small number of cases, you will get bleeding and this hyphema can be disturbing for a few days, but it will go away. But of course, if you're doing cataract for a patient, expecting vision improvement immediately, he can be disturbed. And that's why she here, we inject at the end of the surgery air, or you can leave some for a while before you, you go out of the eye, some viscoelastic in the anterior chamber just to tamponate the bleeding side. And then you remove the viscoelastic and you can leave some air inside to tamponade again, decrease the possibility of dispersion of the hyphema. So it's a very good, efficient technique. Whether you do it with, with open angle glaucoma, more so now we're checking in angle closure glaucoma, very cheap, very simple, very efficient as well, either to make the patient stop if he's in drugs, if he's using one or two drugs, or decrease the number of drugs from three or four to one drug, which is already achievement, that you can target the post-operative target intraocular pressure that you need according to the condition of the optic disc of the patient. So let's move in a more complicated cases and more challenges. This is a patient who can some sort of glaucoma surgery before you see a huge iridectomy. It seems it was complicated. The iris 
is flare, it could have been a secondary glaucoma, there is posterior anechia all around, mature cataract. Then again, it's a shallow anterior chamber. So you have to face the challenge in a stepwise manner. You will see what's the problem, shallow anterior chamber. Your main challenge is the capsular axis. It is intumescent. The main challenge is the capsular axis. There is synechia all over it, so you have to get rid of the synechia at the beginning because you, it will be more difficult after doing the capsular axis. One of the nice things to do to use is the bent cystitomes just to engage the iris and dissect uh, the, the synechia all over. You see, with the bent cystitome, you just engage the iris, taking care not to puncture the capsule, and then injecting viscoelastic by both the traction and by sweeping movement, you can dissect the synechia and widen a bit the pupil with capsular stain. You have to be careful because these cases, you don't want complications like, like a normal case that you can manage easily and the rest are, rest are less. So you have to be very careful doing a properly sized capsular axis. So now you, you are facing the first cha challenge, doing axis in a shallow chamber, to see sanikia, and you missing cataract. So we did the, uh, we got uh, over all this and it's a wide cataract, so it's not really hard. So you don't need to use ultrasound. You just aspirate the content. So this is the, the part, the difficult part is finished. Be careful not to open the posterior capsule during irrigation aspiration. Here I'm trying to wash the posterior capsule as I usually do, but it's not washed. There is a membrane. So again, if I have the membrane, again, I will either try to peel it, or if it doesn't work, I will do a posterior capsular axis. Here I'm trying to peel it, as you can see, and that's why I'm using high magnification. High magnification is a very valuable tool to let you understand on, on your casual cases, exactly the behavior of every tissue inside the eye, including the posterior capsule, so you don't fear to deal with it. And you don't fear to peel a membrane over the posterior capsule if you need to do so. And remember the retina surgeons, they can peel the internal limiting membrane. So why not us can peel a membrane over the posterior capsule like what I just did. Then we implant the lens in the capsular bag, make sure it is in the capsular bag. And then here, I'm widening the capsular axis a little bit to avoid capsular phimosis. And in these patients, postoperatively, you should monitor again the intraocular pressure. This is another example of a huge cystic uh, blep in a patient who probably done sector iridectomy for some reason, and he has an intumescent cataract, central corneal opacity, and the iris here is adhering to the back of the cornea. So this is one of the cases that can come to you presenting for you to do the cataract surgery, but there are so many challenges here. One of them is this functioning blip. Is it functioning or not functioning? We have to check the pressure. And uh, if it is functioning and it's overfiltrating, you, you might be faced with a case of hypotony. Doing the surgery phaco in a hypotonous eye is, is not easy because the anterior chamber tends to deepen and makes surgery difficult. It's not impossible, but it, it is, you have to be aware of this problem. You avoid completely the area of the blab, avoid it completely, and then you go again, as always in any challenging case to yeah, in your mind, start to say what are the problems I'm facing. I'm facing visualization. I know there is iris adherent here, and I have an intumescent cataract, and I want to protect the, the corneal endothelium. And again, I don't want to touch or get near this blab. So here, the first step, I cut this adhesion to the back of the cornea, and you can manipulate the eye while doing urexis. And in tumescent cataract here, I'm dealing with it as any in tumescent cataract, capsular stain, just a slit with a curve 
to avoid the Argentinian flag sign, and then you move on. Whenever you find high pressure, you can aspirate. If not, keep pressurizing the interior chamber with viscoelastic to avoid any extension of the capsular axis. Again, it is very important to uh, do a proper capsular axis, and I'm here trying to make it not very large, but not very small. The periphery of the capsular axis, when it opacifies, will help to cover the area of the iris defect. So it will decrease the glare for the patient. Surgery is not easy. That's why a capsular axis, proper capsular axis, is important. And you try to manipulate the eye so as to overcome the central corneal opacity. And here I'm using only vacuum. And you see the left eye is essentially helping, the left hand is essentially help, will help to manipulate the nucleus if needed. Don't use in this area any ultrasound. The bad visualization is making everything more difficult. And because of the not easy availability of corneal tissue, unfortunately, now in Egypt, and because of the expense of corneal uh, transplant, and this patient has been living with this corneal opacity for a long time, so it's a good thing to just give a chance for uh, just cataract removal and see how things will go. Bad visualization is always your enemy. I'm planting a three piece. I prepared the three piece because I was not sure that I will get a, a, the lens in the capsular bag, but if you have it in the capsular bag, it's a good thing. But having a three piece lens is a good choice. In some cases, again, like you have to work in a bad condition. This is a case, it's chronic angle closure glaucoma with almost corneal decompensation, edematous, dense cataract. So we said we will try to remove the lens, open the angle and see what will happen. And then later on, if we need to do a DMEC, in a deeper chamber, then maybe this will be a good choice. So to see that during the surgery, you have to scrape the epithelium. doing basically the section of the peripheral anterior synechia. Dissecting the synechia. Capsulorexis. Fake omulsification, again, again, look to the power here. It's zero most of the time, and if I use the power, it would be like eight or 10%. So the main player is vacuum. And because the epithelium is removed, the visualization is better. And then dissecting Sinica and planting the lens in the capsular bag. One of the things that can be used is this stretching, and you might do a Pupilloplasty. Amara Grawal, as you know, have published a paper in angle closure glaucoma of using the pinpoint pupil. Here, I'm not doing this. I'm just stretching the iris away after doing the viscous dissection. And you can see the bleeding coming from the area of the synechia. I will just do the uh, one suture just to stretch the iris in this area to avoid the recurrence of the peripheral anterior synechia. So using the straight needle here, of 10-0 proline, 
and you pass it from one point to the other, So this is another uh, challenge during these combined surgeries because you are not doing, you are not facing only one challenge or facing multiple challenges to complete your phaco surgery, but also you want to assure not to jeopardize again the intraocular pressure. You try to solve the problem at the same time. This is four, four throws knot. And then I switch. So this area is stretched. One last thing is that in angle closure glaucoma and phacomorphic glaucoma due to intimescent cataract, I'll just, this is a very old movie, but I just want to show you the idea. If the anterior chamber is very shallow and the pressure is high and you cannot go into the anterior chamber, then the only solution after, if you check that you cannot go, it's very shallow anterior chamber, very compressed anterior chamber, then you can do a sclerotomy and blindly, all the times they said you can do a, a vitreous aspiration just to decompress the vitreous. Of course, now we use a 23 gauge uh, oculotome and you go direct it to the mid vitreous and with high cutting rate, low vacuum just to debug the vitreous. So this will give space for the lens to settle down. So the anterior chamber will deepen and then you can do your surgery as normal. Of course, with the difficulties of having an intumescent cataract and you're trying to protect the cornea endothelium with preferred anterior, with posterior sanitia usually. So what I've done here is I've done the vitrectomy deep in the anterior chamber. And you can see now I can inject viscoelastic in the anterior chamber that is deep in and dissecting the sinechia with the posterior sinechia or the peripheral anterior sinechia with viscodissection. And then now uh, it, I am able to face the challenge of the cataract itself, the entumescent cataract. But this entumescent cataract have induced the secondary glaucoma that made everything very challenging and very difficult. So I, I, you turn the situation that is combined shallow anterior chamber, high pressure into only a condition of entumescent cataract with its own difficulty. Replenishing every now and then with viscoelastic, viscoadhesive to protect the corneal endothelium is very important. If I want to send you one message in most of what I've said, is that if you're doing cataract in a glucomatous patient, whatever, patient, whatever his degree uh, of, uh, of control, protect the corneal endothelium. This is your main challenge in cataract surgery in such cases. So one important thing is that you can see a patient without glaucoma, and he, he likes pseudo exfoliation. You can know the, you can see a patient with pseudo exfoliation that does not have glaucoma, or he will get glaucoma. These patients are high risk to get an open angle glaucoma. So be careful to protect the endothelium. Make sure that this patient they have zonulysis. So your technique should be very careful. If you need to put a capsule tension in. Or put it, try to avoid complications because if you have complication, you increase the risk of secondary glaucoma in such patient. So in pseudo exfoliation, the main thing you remember is that these patients are more liable to glaucoma. Either you discover it preoperatively, get it postoperatively, they have higher chance of uh, zonulysis or weak zonules. So your technique should be very careful in the capsular bag, if you need to use a capsular tension ring, use it, don't hesitate. It would be of great help later on. Again, the vacuum is the main player. This is a very rare case of uh, this patient. I didn't you know, notice, it's a, a, mother, a mother of a doctor. It's an immature cataract, she's not glaucomatous. And if you see here, observe the zonules. What I discovered starting the surgery, I saw the zonules are inserted all around, very, very central. For me, it was my first time to see this. And then I said my challenge, well, my challenge will be to, to do the capsular axis without cutting through these zonules. 
Actually, this is what this is what I did. And I was happy, very happy that I, I, I could complete the capsular axis safely. But then, then during the surgery, I found that the holes in ewels are displaced. And this, when I looked it up in, in, the, in the literature, it's called long anterior zonule syndrome. And this patient, during the surgery, I removed the whole bag and implanted an iris claw lens. And I thought my problems ended, but actually this patient developed an intractable glaucoma postoperatively uh, that needed surgery later on. And as I told you, when I looked, it's called long anterior zonule syndrome, LAS. It can be complete, which is less common, like this case, or partial. So you have always to look at this. If you know, if once you see it, once you recognize it, and these patients have a genetic predisposition to get glaucoma, and usually they will do so after the cataract surgery. So this is again, it's a, a, a major challenge for you to spot this patient and do the proper surgery, proper planning, not to get into the problems I get, and to observe the intraocular pressure post-operatively to avoid any uh, unattended glaucoma. So in conclusion, there are a lot of challenges for cataract surgery in glaucoma patients. Take emulsification, yes, can reduce intraocular pressure in different types of glaucoma in different amounts and different significance. You have to be careful in fake emulsification in glaucoma patients, particularly for the cornea endothelium. Combined or sequential surgery should be judged according to each individual patient condition. Weighing risks versus benefits. Mix can be perfect combination with fake emulsification in early and moderate cases of glaucoma, particularly GAT. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yahya, for, uh, as usual, uh, fantastic presentations and uh, the, uh, the cases, cases that we learned a lot from. Uh, now I open the floor and let's start with the Basel. Um, any discussion, any remarks, questions, Basel? Amazing videos, amazing surgeries, you know. Um, Actually, I don't. I don't think uh, we have any questions, but I have some questions. The first one uh, regarding the gut gut procedure. You know, uh, do you? You know, previously it was so that the shelf created of the goniotomy closed. Uh, that's why uh, the goniotomy procedure done with the pediatric glaucoma wasn't so popular in the adult group. But now the gut opened the floor to better results. Do you use any pillow carbine after the uh, procedure, just to you know, especially in cases of uh, angle closure, just to prevent the PAS or prevent the closing the shelf? No. In our department, it's really done a lot. As I told you, I did only one or twice, but I observed the patients in surgery and follow up. Actually, they are doing very, very well, much, much better than expected. Especially, we have, you know, we'll soon publish a series for angle closure. It's, uh, the results are very, very good, and it's a simple procedure, really, you know, a very fast procedure. The only take, you know, again, is that with combined surgery, is the hakim blood, but this you can overcome. Yes, I agree. And, um, you know, I was very happy to, to point several times about the corneal endothelium because, uh, you know, some, some reports saying ju just uh, eye drops itself can cause a little bit of uh, endothelial cell loss with time. Others says no. Anyhow, glaucoma patients are very valuable for uh, endotheliopathy especially the PECs, uh, the uh, serial oxidation uh, patients, you know. Sometimes we see uh, PECs in the one eye, but PECs is always bilateral, but it comes first uh, in one eye and the other eye follows. So uh, many reports has, have shown that uh, there is endothelial cell loss or, you know, not healthy uh, endothelium in, in both eyes. 
even if we just uh, see x in one eye. So this is just to to uh, have in mind that uh, you know when when uh, operating those patients. Thank you so much for pointing this point. I, I agree because. And sometimes the surgeon is more very much focused on removing the cataract, but if sometimes in other patients the chorea and is forgiving, in glaucoma patients it is not forgiving. Exactly. Um, about the uh, IUB spikes, you know, uh, in glaucoma and non-glaucoma patients, do you uh, prefer any uh, IUB lowering agent after after the surgery? regardless what the IUP was before the surgery, or what, what's your approach, Professor Yahya? Yeah, uh, uh, regularly I, I would uh, prescribe uh, either a, uh, like something like Cusop, for example, uh, carbonic hydrate inhibitor with beta blocker, just for one week, and we see the, how the effect, just to pass the area. Normally I don't get Cidamex, except if I know there is some viscoelastic left, or I'm um, afraid of the very compromised optic disc, I would give post-operatively one uh, mm. tablet of sedimentary. But usually, I see these patients, we see, after, see them after surgery because the, Skype, uh, the spike will, do, will happen like two hours, one hour, two hours after surgery. Mm. So, but I will always give, at least for the first week, anti-glucoma. Of course, definitely not prostaglandin. Mm, exactly. Yes, I I do prefer the um, you know the alpha agonist. Alpha. Yes, um, I, I like it because we have two mechanism mechanisms. You know, just uh, producing the um, the uh, reducing the production of uh, of uh, equus and uh, increasing the outflow at the same time. But uh, there's uh, unfortunately I just um, you know examined the literature. There's no. Uh, consensus of the best, you know, agent of the surgery, but we have to to use something at least. I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't think we have any questions from the audience, uh, so I don't know. I have one question actually about the um, uh, the uh, biometry, the uh, IOL calculation. You know, uh, especially in those short eyes. Uh, do you prefer one formula uh, over the others, or what do you think? Uh, it's, maybe Dr. Mazin will answer better than me. But uh, I think we we try different different uh, formulas, like Hofer, K, whatever. You know, uh, there is Barrett, I think. One, it's not the best for uh, uh, for short eyes, but we ask the people who do biometry to do multiple uh, formulas to try to find which is best. Maybe Dr. Mezzi can ask, answer this. But usually, whatever you use in very short eyes, I think the biometry is never uh, is accurate, particularly those who you need 45 uh, doctors. And... Yes, Professor Marzin, what do you think? Yeah, <clears throat> I totally agree that uh, there is no one formula for uh, th that's super. Um, this is why in always in extreme cases, we have to, uh, to do the measurements with multiple formulas, and then we can decide um, for the uh, yeah, best, correct, best uh, uh, size. However, uh, there are some formulas that are superior to others. And um, let me tell you some information about this. Uh, in general, the ESCRS calculator, ESCRS calculator that is launched uh, uh, very launched recently. This year. Yeah. Actually, it is uh, not the ESCRS, not the American, the European. And with the new formulas like the EVO, like, uh, and it contains uh, other formulas that they already exist. But however, um, Hofer QST is the best when, uh, uh, when we face uh, axial, high axial hypermetropia. Comes mm -hmm. next, Barrett Universal 2. 
okay, comes next. But offer QST is the best. Uh, even compared with the Kane formula, Dr. Mazin? Um, Kane formula, actually, it is good, very good for keratoconus, mm. for keratoconus cases. But uh, Hofer QST is superior to it mm. in, uh, in high axial hypertrophy. Yes, very nice. Thank you for the tips. I've already uh, sent the um, the link for the new uh, ISRS uh, calculator to the chat. Everyone will, you know, uh, as, as you said, Dr. Mazen, uh, there's six or seven new formulas with, especially in those cases when you have, you know, like uh, shallow EC or uh, short I or very long I, you have to, as uh, Professor Yahya has, has said, that you have to look uh, at many uh, formulas, not just take one formula. Thank you for uh, pointing that. So we have one question from the audience. Uh, one, one minute just to... And it's from Dr. Uh, Rana. Oh, mm. Yes. Uh, the longer it is in US because I was not aware of it. I didn't see it in the slate lamp. And uh, I was surprised when I saw it this complete. I've never seen it that. And usually you are met interoperatively with partial long ideas in use, and you always say you see this, avoid the news. But I've never seen that long ideas in use 360 degrees. So if I meet another case, I would be prepared from the beginning with. It, while doing my rexes, like I did in that case properly, but my mistake was I was not prepared. I would do immediately after I do the, the rexes, I would prepare uh, two Ahmed segments or a Sayuni ring and suture it to the uh, sclera to fix the, uh, the capsule to make sure that the bag would be stable while doing the fix. Alternatively, I can use capsular hooks we prepared all through the surgery and then implant after the vacuum multiplication a Sayoni ring to fix the back with two holes. Sayoni with two uh, holes to fix. So I will prepare every all this if I do if I see it again. And actually now. I'm aware of this, so I look at the slit lamp and starting at the surgery, I look where are the, the news because it's not a very good surprise if they are not prepared. Very nice. Professor Yahya, you just, you know, said that you just uh, looked at the literature about these long zinnules. I had one case and I didn't have so much problem with the zinnules. So do all the eyes with long zinnules have weak zinnules or what's the mechanism beyond that? Uh, no, actually, there is not much of the literature. If you look at the literature, there are very few case reports. And one study was done, done by an American. Uh, it, it was really looking at the genetics of these patients and the relation to glaucoma. Mm. No, no, no. This, actually, when I presented this like three years ago, uh, uh, I presented in the ECRS and in Egypt. Many of my colleagues, like two other colleagues, have reported similar ones, and they used more uh, intelligent technique than I used because they were aware of it. And actually, we were thinking to collect these cases and, and uh, publish as case report series. Mm -hmm. But in the, you will not find a lot talking about is it weak the news or not. I just didn't have time to do the whole uh, video, but. It's already on YouTube, I have it, and I can send it to you the whole video. Yes, that would be very nice. Thank you. So, um, we don't have any other questions. I don't know if uh, Dr. Mazen have any um, comment or... Uh, actually, no. MashaAllah, I don't think it's here. I'll take the word. And I think uh, no more questions. Great, mashallah, on time, uh, very condensed uh, content, and a lot of lessons to learn. Thank you very much, Professor Rufia. Thank you very much, Dr. Basil. And uh, thanks to all the attendees, and hope to see you next year with um, 
new ideas in glaucoma education, inshallah. inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Melvin. Thank you, Dr. Bessel. Nice to see you both. Thank you so much. Yeah, good, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.